All right. So welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, students and community members. Um, good evening. My name is Amy Sanchez Artiaga, and I am facilitating the Amplify lecture series um, for students and community this semester. We're so pleased to have you here for our first lecture of the semester. Um, before we begin uh, with tonight's talk, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, the Kumeyaay people are the people whose land our university is built upon. And I also want to acknowledge um, that Mitsuko Brooks is uh, joining us this evening from Lenape uh, land. So we just want to recognize and honor the continued relationship um, that these communities have with their territories and offer our thanks for their continued stewardship of these lands. Um, so our, our, our great thanks and um, yeah, just appreciation of the Kumeyaay and Lenape people. So um, I welcome students, faculty, and community again to this first lecture uh, in this fall's Amplify series. Um, and the SDSU community thanks Michelle Schlecht for her genuine, uh, generous and continued support of Amplify. Amplify Responding in Context is a lecture series that centers the production of BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, LGBTQIA+, and people with disabilities in order to equip our students and participating community with the necessary context and critical perspectives to participate and engage meaningfully with urgent polemics and debates in contemporary cultural production. Tonight, our speaker is Mitsuko Brook. Uh, Mitsuko Brooks is a one and a half Shin Issei Japanese American. Um, uh, Mitsuko was born in the Misawa Air Force Base in Japan and lives in New York. Uh, Brooks has created work across the mediums of assemblage, collage, and most notably mail art. This work navigates spaces between poetry, acts of correspondence, the ready-made intimacy, and the public sphere by invoking a dialogue with the page itself, with history, and with our communities across space and time, as well as her specific interlocutors in these works. Brooks' intervention offers us modalities for considering art practice as a form of communication always and already, one that hails us and asks that we respond to it by creating networks of healing, self-knowledge, friendship, and solidarity against politics of isolation. Her work shows us a way that we might integrate gestures of resistance and insistence upon justice into quotidian tasks as ways of caring for self and caring for others. Mitsuko Brooks received her MFA in painting and drawing from UCLA, her BFA uh, from Cooper Union, and um, MLS and certificate in archives and preservation of cultural materials from Queens College. She's a member of the Asian American Women Artists Association and attended the Oxbow School. Her work has been featured in the Los Angeles Times and Hyperallergic, um, and she's completed numerous residencies and been awarded grants from the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, the Foundation for Contemporary Arts and Common Field, among others. Her work has been exhibited at venues such as the San Francisco Institute, uh, Art Institute, Soma Arts, Smack Mellon, and the New Wright Gallery. Uh, Brooks's artist books, and zines, as well as the male art collages, are in permanent collections, including the Smithsonian's Archive of American Art, Canada's Art Text Information Center, the Barnard College Library, uh, the Asian American Archive in America, and the Los Angeles Contemporary Archive. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming Mitsuko Brooks. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, you gave me a great introduction, so. Yeah, I just got nervous all of a sudden just to say that out loud. Um, it's good to be here with you all. And I'm going to just give you a little context about um, my personal history. Um, 
a little bit about like why I like male art and some of my earlier pieces of male art and then this one body of work that I've decided to talk about protest songs. Um, okay, so um, yeah, as Amy said, I, um, I was I was born in Japan. So I'm, um, my father's Caucasian and my mother's Japanese and um, my father's family kind of, you know, they made a living um, with a dry cleaning business in Pennsylvania. And um, he went to the military um, and then went to college. And, um, and then my mother was, um, her, her family, her father was like employed through the city in Japan and um, they had like, I think a lot of poverty during the war and she's um, working class as well. And, um, and so they met outside of a youth hostel in London and they, you know, and then they, they brought us into the world, myself and my siblings. And so that's just a picture of my grandmother and my mother in one of her apartments in Japan. Sorry. Can I help you? Scott? Yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to go to the next slide. Um, is there the advanced arrow that you can access from here? Yeah, your... I'm like hitting the arrow. Oh, wait. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think so you could you can maybe close the presentation. Okay, and then just start and then again. open it. Yeah, some I, I know. Sometimes that. it just kind of freezes, huh? Yeah, that's okay. okay. No worries. Sorry. Sorry about that. No need to apologize. It's all right. Okay. Yeah, and um, in other talks, people have asked me, uh, you know what like why did you decide to study art? And so in giving that context about my parents and their upbringing, um, I, I think that they both really wanted to study the arts and didn't feel like they could because they were more in a living phase. Um, and so they always had art supplies at home and always took us to museums and, um, always just like like here they took us to the flight line and um wanted us just to make art and that's my sister on the right ginger books takahashi she's this amazing artist that does social practice and then my brother on the left um and myself in the middle um yeah um you know why Sorry. I'm like pressing the arrows. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, there. That's interesting. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my male art, and um, these are just some of pieces I made last year, um, probably starting during lockdown. And um, I'm a big fan of male art because I feel like within the fine art world, it is a like great equalizer. Um, anyone can make it there's if you ever like want to just there's look online there's so many open calls um, that don't charge you money and maybe they're not at like a huge blue chip gallery but you can have a show like 
in another country or somewhere, you know, in a gallery um, and just submit your mail art. And the big context usually is that you don't get it back. So it's for everyone. It's easy to make, you know, you don't need a giant studio. You just need like a postcard to collage on or a piece of cardboard or whatever material you want. And um, so I don't know if any of you saw Octavia Butler's, um, it was like an exhibition of her writings at the Huntington Garden in Los Angeles around 2017, I think. And so these are not artworks per se, but they were some of her writings and they, I think about them a lot and they inspire me. So I'm just sharing them and I'm gonna read this. Tell stories filled with facts, make people touch and taste and know, make people feel, feel, feel. And then here's another one that she wrote on the back of a spiral notebook. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I'll just read like a section. Um, each of, this is my life. I will write best-selling novels. My novels go onto the bestseller list on or shortly after publication. My novels each travel up to the top of the bestseller list and they reach the top and they stay on top for months, at least two so be it, see to it, I will find the way to do this, so be it, see to it. And I like this idea, um, and I think about it a lot of visioning and manifestation and having positive thoughts about whatever you're doing, um, wherever you are, like in whatever kind of scale of success that you see, and just to believe in yourself. And I've made pieces that were kind of inspired about it. So this is part of my process. I use discarded library book covers. I used to work at a library and um, they would rebind the books and cut off the covers with a razor blade, put some of them on the giveaway truck because it was like a art and architecture and engineering library. So the artists would take them um, and others they would throw away. So I gathered so many that I had in a box and I've just been using for years. And then I um, collage on top of them with end pages, text paintings I've made that I'm embarrassed or don't like and rip them up. And then um, some rice paper or maps of Japan or due date slips and then kind of figure it out um, and then just adhere them with wood glue. And as you can see from this image, I work um, at home. So that was the living room. And I'm also really interested, not in the context of this letter, but I, so I was working at the Cooper Union Library Archive and I processed a lot of um, letters and I, Peter, between Peter Cooper, Abram Hewitt and different people. And I'm really into cursive and letter writing and handwriting and I had never seen these capital H's and A's and the I's. I was not taught that. And I just kind of integrated that into, you see uh, my handwriting style. So I use only the capitals and it's, you know, it's a bit, it changes because it's in my handwriting. And so here I'm working on a, two different pieces um, at my desk in my bedroom. And this is the finished piece. Um, and sometimes I write letters to my, in the past I have written letters to myself, um, kind of in lines with that hopeful thinking. Um, and then, yeah, and other times I also like to work in my bed. Um, I think as someone that has lived with anxiety and depression since I was like maybe in elementary school, I spend a lot of time there. And so this becomes a place of like safety and rest and reflection. Also, sometimes I work in the living room. This is like a former room. And so on the other side of the book cover, I will um, use like a 1970s brother typewriter that was my father's and I'll write the to and from and I'll glue it down. And then I will sometimes like on this one, I will um, 
paint more of a letter or rewrite out their address just for fun because I like the comparison and just the aesthetic and I'll put the stamps on there so I can mail it and I collect the stamps from eBay friends and yeah I like the old and new and so then I walk to the post office and I take pictures of myself walking there behind the background that is in my neighborhood at that time, it was Ridgewood, Queens. Um, Ulysses Carrion is this very fascinating experimental artist from Mexico. This quote, I'll read it. An artist doesn't need to live in an art capital to have his voice heard. And as a matter of fact, there are centers of mail art activity in places where there are no art galleries, but only a modest post office. So this uh, you know, just reaffirms what I was saying earlier about how anyone can make mail art. You don't have to be an artist. You don't have to live in a major city. Um, yeah. And so sometimes when I'm waiting in line at the post office, I'll take some extra pictures too. During the pandemic, the lines were much longer than usual. And this is my, this is today, I took this photo and this is like my local post office in Kensington, Brooklyn. Um, this, is, this is another Ulysses carry on page from one of his writings with a diagram that I thought was fascinating. And I don't know, might be helpful for visual people, people who like diagrams, just understanding how text and image and printed media and mail art fit in. <clears throat> uh, Dolores Hayden wrote this amazing book, The Power of Place. Um, and this quote is, urban landscapes are storehouses for social memories. Streets, buildings, and patterns of settlement frame the lives of many people and often outlast lifetimes. And I, I think that this just relates to my love of mail art and why I do it because it captures a city, a place like I used to live in that I no longer live in because I move usually every six months to a year. And then it captures like the friend that I sent it to as well. So they become documents of time. Yeah, and also I think it makes me think about what I didn't say earlier was part of my childhood was a military childhood so we moved every three years and to different states and countries and so I don't have a physical family home that I can go visit and so um, perhaps there's a longing I have right for a home or the stability and the male art pieces um, they kind of trap time and they, they trap this kind of trans, transient life I have. So this body of work I mentioned earlier, I'm going to talk about is protest songs. And it was not exactly planned out. Um, my, you know, as many of us were witnessing the Black Lives Matter protests, um, specifically, right, the George Floyd ones and Breonna Taylor. And I was watching them on my phone, on Instagram. And my friend was, she had something in her story and it was in the West Village in Manhattan. And it was a group of predominantly white young people walking in the streets, chanting white silence equals violence over and over again. And um, when I really like like a word, I hear a sentence, I'll just write it down. And at this, also at the same time, this group I was involved with, AMWA, um, they're like a radical arts workers based in Los Angeles. Pan-Asian based, um, asked me to donate artwork for the Watts Community Corps. And I thought that I would just, you know, either like remake a new one like this or something like that. And then 
at that time, it just made sense to take the words that I heard and write them on the piece and send them to the person that donated. <clears throat> and that just kind of kept happening, right? There were so many protests, some not as many I was able to attend. This one I was able to at the, the Brooklyn Liberation March outside of the Brooklyn Museum. And this is Raquel Willis um, and part of her speech, her words were, I believe in my power. I believe in your power. I believe in our power. I believe in black trans power. And I, I felt like those were very powerful words. And so on the right, you can see I hand painted them um, onto a vintage Japanese postcard and then mailed them to people. So sometimes they were reproductions of protest chants I heard. And then this one was an imagined protest chant. I did, so I did not hear it, but um, there's a lot of work being done for reparations to happen as a Japanese American and knowing that reparations were made towards Japanese Americans that were interned. I feel really strongly that this should happen. So I made this mail art piece. Um, and then here was, so then also when I would see online friends that had posted images from protests and I really liked the words like that small white text um, on black background that says your anger is a gift. And it really just stood out to me. And so I painted it onto a piece and um, sometimes I find it a little frustrating that I don't know who made that. Um, and the, you know, the, to give credit, I find that very important, especially because, um, yeah, right? Like ownership, authorship. And um, so I just cite like the location where the protest was, what was the protest about and the date. And then I always like ask my friends, like if it's okay to use that image and stuff. And here's another one. And I'll read this one. If you've ever wondered what you're doing, what you do during slavery, the Holocaust or civil rights movement, you're doing it right now. Um, and like, sometimes I, I wouldn't know the person. So I reached out to them and asked them if I could like reuse the text from this image. And they actually said they had just reshared it and they didn't know. And then I eventually found it was actually from a, a blog written by Maya Bird. So, um, it's, it's just interesting where these words are coming from, like who actually wrote them. When the rich rob the poor, it's called business. When the poor fight back, it's called violence. Um, this one was, there was a lot of looting happening in New York and Soho and the Bronx. Um, and there was a lot of debate about it. And I thought that this, the sign was pretty great. <clears throat> um, and so this one says, it is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. And it was a protest chant I heard on my classmate, my former classmates, Instagram stories at a protest that she was at. And then it was interesting to find out that it was actually words by Asada Shakur in her autobiography. <clears throat> and I would repeat, you know, we must love each other and support each other. So there would be a lot of repetition and translation in multiple pieces. Um, and people would like, asked me for the mail art online during this time and there would be an exchange of money and I was kind of grappling with how did it feel you know that 
I'm not black, but I do care so much about um, the murders and the injustices. And um, so I would just donate the funds back to different organizations that I felt like were important, like Glitz and the Black Trans Travel Fund and others. Yeah, and that's, that's it. Thank you so much, Mitsuko, for, for that presentation and for sharing that context around um, these pieces. So the, um, yeah, like there's, we're getting some claps, <laughs> some little digital claps. Um, I, I, or my sort of um, prompt in this, in this class and the theme um, overall in the semester has been really asking contemporary culture producers, so artists and different people working in the cultural field, um, like yourself, to think about and to share with us about the contexts that are informing um, their work and the way that they're working um, in this in this time in this moment. And so I thank you for sharing a kind of a, what I see as like what I wrote down in my notes is a kind of like tripartite like this three part approach that I see um, run through that I, I think maybe that'll be like the opening question that um, I just like to ask about because I think it ties together numerous kind of student questions that we have prepared for you um because i hear i hear whenever i hear you speak and what i think is really compelling is a personal story that interfaces with a public story um so in this case uh with the protest songs body of work um like and i think as with the um the uh, Lemois piece that you shared with the class to read, right? This kind of interfacing of a personal context with a very public and very political context. But then also I see you as somebody who is really so meticulous about um, citational practice. Um, and I see that both in your like, a meticulous kind of like seeking out of whose words it is um, that you are including in your work or um, what materials are being included, but also because you are literally um, an archivist. <laughs> I mean, like that's um, like your, your degree now. So I wonder if you would mind just elaborating a little bit further about the kind of intersection of those, of those things in your work and maybe um, a lot of students, oh, the most kind of reoccurring question was about how you go about that process of selection, both of text and material. So maybe if you can um, tackle that really big question that I gave you, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, like the overlay between being like an archivist and an artist, yeah. Um, it was just like really practical. I just was like working in a library. Um, I think some people, oh, this is good because you guys are young and like figuring out your lives. So I've noticed like when I was younger, I noticed it, but I didn't really like realize it until I was older, but um, it's good to like apply to different jobs and internships and like, and keep moving and like going to new ones and not staying at the same one. And so I didn't have a lot of like self-esteem or like understanding about how to like chase your monetary or, you know, professional career. So I just was like a student shelver in the college library. And then I just became the circulation assistant. And then they like, we all got along, it was a small staff. And then they just trained me to do archives. So then I just, so it was just like my day job. Um, and I think when you're just a rep, for me, when I'm, whatever I'm around, it like feeds into my artwork, right? Or whatever I'm doing. And so I was around all these materials that were free and I like collaging. And so it just, it just became stuff for me to use. Like I was talking about, like I showed that letter, right? So I also had to read lots of letters and transcribe them and so I was just staring at the handwriting so that kind of just that happened but none of it was like planned um 
I like, I can't, it's really hard to like step out of myself sometimes and like see like really what's happening. It's more of just like a going through the motions. Um, so I don't know what the complete overlay is. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I do. Yeah. Right. A big part of like bibliographies or information. I know it's also, I just have like some kind of OCD stuff, like and I just think it, like I was saying earlier, the responsibility of the citations and it, you know, someone had even given me a critique that I shouldn't have even made that body of work and that it was unethical. And so um, I know that the citations and then giving the funds back were ways that I felt to try to like neutralize it. So I wasn't having like, I don't know, right? So it wasn't saying these are my words. And then so I wasn't profiting off of it. Yeah. I think uh, another um, question that emerged was like in some of the assemblage work that you have on your website um, that we took a look at a little bit in class and that a few of the students looked at, they also noticed that um, you would know the kind of items um, that you had included in those works that pertain to a particular person. So whether it was like a, a card from your mother or a fan from a specific person. Um, and there was a few students who were just curious about um, how and why you go about the selection of the inclusion of those kinds of materials in some of the more three-dimensional work that you've produced. Mm. Yeah, again, it's like, I don't know why I'm yeah I'm just really into personal histories and um items like clothing items right or just like any item that's someone that you love or respect or care about and gives you and that relationship is ended or estranged um or something so I think it becomes like a way of holding on to the person and the memory of them and then kind of commemorating it right or it's like I have you have I have no control over how people come in and out of my life but I guess I have some kind of control over this object that they gave me or this you know this object that holds a memory of them in our relationship and so putting it in a piece feels very um, powerful and important for me um, instead of it like falling in the bottom of a box and you forget about it yeah and I, I feel like there's there's like a like an emotional charge and so I like to believe that that emotional charge comes into the piece yeah I think that actually that's um I think that's even how some folks articulated it, right? When they were writing about the work. So I think that's true. And in having seen your work, I, I would agree with that. Um, we have a, a few questions also. I'm just trying to get the like, the, the big, like the ones where several people asked uh, maybe out of the way and then I'll open it up for other folks um, to ask in the chat or if they can like raise their digital hand. Um, but a, a, quite a few folks asked about um, both. So in your artist statement, um, you include these aspects of your identity. So being um, Shin Issei, Japanese American um, and your sort of birthplace um, on, um, on an Air Force base, and then um, the the fact that in um, the well, and in the presentation just now, you kind of uh, mentioned this kind of nomadic upbringing that um, that was just like a kind of factor of your biography and upbringing. So I think a few students were just wondering how it is that um, the that kind of um, early life experience, um, um, yeah, just has. Um, played out, I guess, in, in your work. I think you spoke to that a little bit, um, but I I wonder especially, um, I'm, I'm actually not sure if everybody in the class is aware about the incarceration of Japanese American folks um, um, during World War II. So maybe that's, because um, I think when speaking about the reparations piece um, and, and that part of your identity, I wonder, if that's maybe something that you could um, elaborate a little bit about. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. and yeah, oh, 
did you have more to say? Sorry. No. Okay. Um, yeah, I like that question. I was thinking about it. Um, just like I'm going to talk about one part and then the other part. A lot just throughout my entire life since, yeah, in school, um, like looking how I look and then um, growing up in predominantly white educational spaces. Um, people always ask me what I am. People always, you know, always, I don't know. It's just so perhaps that's part of this idea of naming oneself and saying my background. But then I've, I don't know, I was even thinking about it today and that question. And I was like, is it even a re-perpetuation of feeling like I have to tell people, um, right? And there's different um, opinions about being an artist and saying your background and talking about it. And like, where is the separation between your racial identity um, and your work? Um, I think it's something I'm still thinking about, but I choose to name it um, because it's a big part of who I am. And I will say though, I was born in Japan on an Air Force base and we did, we left when I was very young and I've never been back. Um, and none of my known family members were interned in the camps. Um, so yeah, I during the war, Japanese Americans were forced out of their homes lost their property, their businesses. They were given like, I feel like it was 72 hours to pack up whatever they could into some suitcases and put on buses and forced to live in basically concentration camps. Um, and then there were, you know, after that long time of release and trying to get your lives back together. There were a lot of activists that worked really hard to get reparations, to try to make some peace for what was taken from them. And all of that happened, right? And so like, there's still strong like anti-Asian sentiment. And I think it's related to that. Um, and the hate that exists in the world. Um, yeah, but it is really interesting because I don't, like, I don't have that experience, but I, I do, like, care so much about it, and it, like, hurts me that that, like, it makes me feel, like, bad that it happened, and um, yeah, but I, I can't even quite, like, say right now with you all, like, what is the exact tie between being Japanese American and making this body of work. I can tell you, like I can script it and be like, oh, there's the Japanese um, experimental movement, Gutai. They made male art and, um, but yeah, I don't know. I think what I see in um, your work, I mean, it's going what I hear you also are, articulate in this talk for us or also just like looking for modes of having solidarity. Um, so even in not maybe having a particular life experience, you know, oneself looking for ways to be in solidarity um, with other people who are experiencing, right, some sort of context of oppression. Um, and maybe so um, we can, I think as a kind of like segue around that, um, one of the students, let me find it. It was toward the end of the questions. So I think that this, this is another one that was just a kind of reoccurring um, sort of question, but somebody just asked about what the hardest part of starting a work um is for you or if there's um a like a piece of advice a couple of folks just asked for advice around how they might start to make um work that 
has some semblance of this kind of solidarity. And so if there's any like pointers or maybe things that you um, think about when you're making a work that you might share to help them as they navigate that. Yeah, the hardest part for me is to get to the moment where I'm motivated to do it. Um, right, like creative, I don't know, like activity comes in waves and it's not every day for me. Some artists or writers, they, you know, or different creative people talk about how they have like a set time and they're like, I'm going to work like, you know, two to four or what, you know, whatever their schedule is or farmer's hours or whatever. Um, I can't do that because I'm just like too chaotic and disorganized, but um, getting to the point where I'm actually just like able to sit down and I'm like, it's time to make work. Um, that's the biggest block for me. And I'll say, I, I haven't even figured out the formula so that I know how to like turn it on so I can get there. It's still a struggle to this day. Um, but I do know that there are some things that do help, right? Like um, doing other creative things that can kind of like get your system going. Um, I don't know, like looking at work that's made, talking to other artists, um, like, yeah, sometimes seeing a really good show or when I used, I remember when I used to TA art classes and seeing that the work that was being made and hearing them talk about it, that would like pull me into a place where I was like, I, I'm like so tired, but I just like want to go home and make work. Um, Definitely like having your materials like out in front of you that you know you're gonna use. I think that is like very helpful. Um, I don't have an art studio, which is like a privilege. And so I think if like I have had them when I was in school or residencies. And so one thing was, I know we would in school, we would talk about like cleaning your art studio and that would be like a restarting activating moment when you felt stuck. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I am going to, I'm going to put the, I'm going to just allow folks to um, unmute themselves because I want to ask, um, maybe there's somebody that would like to ask um, Mitsuko a question. So if you just raise your little digital hand, um, I, I will call on a few folks because we can open it up. I think I asked a lot of questions. <laughs> so art 104 students or community if you'd like to uh, ask a question please raise your hand yes brian hi um so my first question is what does it mean to you to deconstruct the grid specifically how are the collage elements in your artwork representative of you as a designer Thanks for that question. I saw it written out and I was like, oh, um, yeah, it's just a really interesting question because it just like makes me think of the work in a way that I don't think of it, but it is a grid. It's always a rectangle. It's always a square. And, I, and, and I'm deconstruct, you said deconstruct, I'm deconstructing it. Yeah, so um, I guess just looking at your artwork, you in the collage sort of area there's not really a sort of set guide on how to follow collage or assemblage so um i think just looking at your artwork it almost reminds me of postmodernism, where they sort of just create something out of nothing and follow a grid that is the thing that they're working with um and that's what it reminds me of if that makes sense yeah yeah no it your your question makes sense it was just like i didn't know I didn't know exactly how to answer it. Um, but you were at like, how do I, how do I deal with the grid or how do I do it? Yeah, so what's sort of the grid system that you follow? Okay, yeah. So again, like I said, it's like very chaotic and it's not planned out. Some artists make sketches and then they do their piece. And so there is no sketch. Um, like you saw the pieces that were on the living room floor with like the roommates cat walking over them and there's like snacks. Um, 
it's very intuitive. And so it's, it's a, it's like a feeling moment. Um, it, when I place the paper items on the board. Yeah. I can't even, like, oh, I can't you. even name it. Yeah. But thanks for your question. So I think the next person who had a hand up was Hannah Katz. Hi, so I don't know, this isn't more of like a construction question. This is kind of just more of like a personal question for you and your artwork. You mentioned before that you like doing artwork in your bed because of mental health, like struggles that you've had since you were younger. And you mentioned also that you, you referred to your like lifestyle in the beginning as like a nomad, nomadic upbringing. Do you think, or like, do you use your art to like ground yourself? Cause you also mentioned that you like to like hold on to piece people's things. Is that like a sense of like creating like the home for you or like grounding you in a place? Oh yeah, probably. That's a good way of putting it. Um, and yeah, I do. My artwork has very much functioned as, um, a thing that I can do to make myself feel more stable and grounded. Yeah, the letters to the self, that's what they were about. Um, I also did like a, a printed nail art series that was just a daily check-in of um, tracking my moods and my daily habits. Um, because if you have like mental health issues um, or even maybe people that don't, right? I think a lot of us um, during the pandemic who didn't have mental health issues dealt with this, but doing the day-to-day, -day, like um, there was just check mark boxes. Like, did you make your bed? Did you cook your, did you eat three meals a day? Did you take a shower? Did you leave the house? Did you get, did you brush your teeth? Um, and so, all of those things can be very overwhelming most of the time. And so it's quite a lot to remember. And so, yeah, I use my work a lot to try to find some peace in this world. Thank, Thank you, you for that question, Hannah. Uh, Delaney, would you like to ask your question? I see your hand up. Yeah, so um, what what's the most unique or unconventional material that you've you feel like you've used in in your work if you can recall um I like that question yeah because I really like to use all different kinds of materials I was doing these resin pieces in grad school um and I wanted to capture the feeling of like self-disgust because I like live with that a lot, you know, where you like just feel so gross and you hate yourself, but it's this bodily feeling. Um, so I gather, my friend had a um, earwig infestation in his house in Eagle Rock in Los Angeles. And so I asked him to bring them to me. And so we brought these gross bugs in this like sardine can and then I asked people for their fingernail clippings. Um, and then I like got hair from my comb and I like put them all in the resin because I wanted to capture this gross feeling. <laughs> That's one example, but I think I've, I've used lots of many strange, weird materials. Yeah, I like a lot of plant matter stuff. Mitsuko, actually, so somebody, I was just looking at our question list and somebody um, asked you the question because I think this is related to your resin piece. Um, aside of the fact that you, um, in an interview, I think that they found that you did, said that you're drawn to materials or to things that are, um, that you find are kind of unlovable. And so they, uh, this person was just curious about um, you saying more about that. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, as someone with depression and stuff, so it's like, there's a lot of sadness and um, I think part of just dealing with that also is not romanticizing it, but I guess in these pieces in which I do do it, which I guess now in reflection is probably not so healthy, but yeah, it's um, I want to, I want to capture and like hold on to that, um, you know, and a, a lot of the objects, 
They look very worn. Um, even the mail art pieces, I really enjoy how they go through the post office and they get very messed up by the machine or the hands or the postal carrier or the weather. Um, and then sometimes they even get lost. I kind of like that. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I like the, I like the sad, I feel the sad, lonely, lost souls that don't feel like they belong here. And then that um, translated through like some kind of like an old card that's messed up or yeah, I see it translated that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that there is also something so like, um, it's an acute, it sounds to me too, like what you're talking about is an accumulation of experience that an object has too. Right. And, um, I think that that's interesting that I think, I guess when I think about some of those objects, it's maybe there is this kind of like unlovability culture that builds up around certain objects because of all the experience that they accumulate too. So like things that are really layered. Um, I think that that's a, a really beautiful aspect of, of your practice and of your work that I appreciate. Um, a, a student asked, and I think uh, this, this is one, of, so now I'm getting to the more particular questions. Um, so they noticed that in your bio, you mentioned that there was some time that you spent um, in Italy and so this person note, um, notes that in some of the um, assemblage and some of the works that you were making, um, there was something reminiscent for them about Italian architecture. And so they are just curious if that time that you spent in Italy had any um, influence on that work or in general. Um, I think that's there was a couple of questions about Italy for you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we lived um, for three years um, off base from the, it's, it was called Aviano Air Force Base and it's in Northern Italy. So you can like see the mountains, you can drive to like uh, Germany in a day, in less than a day or drive to Slovenia in less than a day. Um, and yeah, my dad had a job there. And so we lived there, um, yeah my mother like I like so she wanted to be an artist so she um she would always like paint the landscapes um the mountains and I think we had some art classes we would go on field trips and go and draw yeah the architecture um yeah we would have like field trips to Venice yeah the yeah perhaps there is, I didn't I never saw that connection but it makes sense why it's there um a lot and those materials probably that you were seeing were discarded from the library that I worked at and I guess I was pulling those specifically but I didn't even know why wow well that's that's so cool <laughs> um I think another another question so there was also several questions about the article that you um asked us to read um and one of them that I think um is an interesting question um just had to do with um I'm gonna instead of paraphrasing it I'm going to look to it specifically in our very long list um and so this person says that um, a lot of people have a kind of, uh, that they're tired of crisis in this moment, that there's this kind of like exhaustion around crisis because of the many tears of crisis that we've been um, living through. And so I guess this person is just curious about, um, so they say, do you believe that political artwork is the most important form of artwork and that we must continue to make it even when we're tired of it? So I think there was a few questions like that around your, um, I think perspective with regard to like being, I think a lot of us are feeling um, fatigued, you know, by this kind of cultural moment that we've lived through. So I think there's this question and then a few that we're just asking about that kind of um, how like in in creating these works and finding kind of reserves to push through and make these works like what that process is like for you as an artist personally. 
Yeah, that feeling is very real that we're all feeling. Um, I think that there, there has always been politically based artwork, right? That's been made. And it, I didn't usually see it so much in, um, I don't know, like what, I don't know, the focus wasn't in museums and galleries on that work that I remember when I was younger. Um, I felt like there, there was a division. Um, the person, I felt like, the, did the question say something like being tired, being tired of looking at it? Um, I think, I think, I don't know, I don't think they specified um, what they were tired about. I think they were just talking about Lemois mentioning that folks are kind of like tired of crisis. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense, but it's, it's so important. The people that have the energy and the reserves to, to carry on the message, right. And to talk about it or to make work about it so that people that aren't maybe focusing on it through whatever level it will reach them maybe, um, or even just to keep talking about it, no matter what, not knowing what it'll do. Um, yeah, and also one thing I forgot to say in my talk was um, I use my sister, like I said, was an artist. Um, I really look up to her. I've learned so much. She would take me to protests in Philly when I was like a teenager. So I, she showed me this world of activism and protests. And it was very strange um, during the, pan the beginnings of the pandemic when there were a lot of protests happening and I wasn't, I didn't feel so able to physically show up. Um, and so that, that body of work was also kind of a response to that, like having some voices are more silent at diff different times of your life or your ability to speak up and talk about something. And so that became like a way to express solidarity. Yeah. I think that that's a, that's a really valuable and important reminder just to also remember that there's there's different forms of showing up even when those uh, like reserves and that energy um, is maybe waning a little bit. Um, and that's, I think that's a really valuable reminder for all of us. Um, we, in, in the questions, I'm trying to just make sure we can get to as many of these as possible. Oh, one of the students, um, this is how the student phrased it, but again, I think there was a few sort of concerns around this question. So this person says, hello, Ms. Brooks, um, as a new artist, I find myself struggling to open up in terms of creating large art and taking up space um, in that way. I notice the distinction in size between your male art, your collage art, and your assemblage pieces. And I was curious if there's a certain mood or atmosphere that inspires you to create bigger art. And in general, I think there was a couple of questions just around like scale or size, Nitsuko, so maybe you can, um, talk about that, because I think that question of scale um, sometimes corresponds to that comment that you just made around capacity, right? Yeah, um, I will say I think it's similar to what I was um, talking about earlier with um, kind of being drawn to like the forgotten, sad, decayed, worn out objects or stories. Um, and it's related to this idea of um, what you just said, but my brain just, sorry. Yeah, the, I, the question was around sort of size and scale. Okay, yeah, scale, and thank you. So, this, so that kind of like is about some, someone that feels small in the world um, and the way small things exist. Um, they're usually forgotten or taken less seriously. And I'm interested in that experience. And I 
have always worked very small. Usually it's four inches by six inches. Um, maybe biggest 12 inches wide. Um, that's the male art. And so I was in graduate school and I needed to, there's this strong thing in the art world to make large works fill up this wall. So I was fulfilling that unspoken idea to like to be a successful artist you have to make a large painting um and and I also had the space to do it so I was able to like explore that um but prior to that art graduate school like I said earlier I didn't have a studio so when you work in like your bedroom you don't have a lot of room so it really makes sense at least for me to work small and then you can also store it very easily yeah that makes that makes sense um I I wonder I want to make sure that students can ask questions themselves if they wish so is there anybody else you can raise your digital hand um that would like to ask a question of Mitsuko because she's here and such a great resource for us. Um, and if also if folks feel shy, yes, Pima would like to ask a question. Um, my question was just like a, a like a like a random question. It was like, um, uh, so like, <laughs> oh, um, like if. Mm, what other art would you like what other like what's your favorite other art besides your own you know does that make sense I'm sorry yes that does make sense um I'm a really big fan of my friend's artwork Lucasa Brantman Verissimo um and I'll look up that link after this question and put it in the chat um yeah they work with text and image, um, I mean like text-based work and uh, political base, um, kind of pushing forth people's stories. And I found out recently that they have a body of work where they collaborated with someone who documented protest chants and then replicated those words onto um, see, like an acetate into like these signs and it was really beautiful. And yeah, all of their work and they're very interested in activism and yeah, so. Mm, nice, <laughs> it's really nice. Thank you Pima for that question. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Ryan, yes. I just had one last question. Um, why do you think it's important to draw outside the lines of traditional artwork? For instance, male art is not paint on canvas, but it can still be considered art. Why do I think it's important to, to draw outside of the traditional ideas of artwork? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the, the art world, the professional art world, or perhaps like the art market, it becomes, there's a lot of complications in it. And there's a lot of, um, pa it's, there's a lot of issues with class um, and power and money and who gets to have, who gets to be invited to be represented by a gallery um, is very few. And it's usually, it's someone you know um, or someone who's advocating for you or someone that met you through a prestigious university, just different things like that. Um, and so it's, it's not a neutral world that is the same as someone who wants to get, like for me, like I went to get the library science degree and then I have the degree and I apply for jobs as a librarian or an archivist. And the response rate is so much, it like, it, it, it happens compared to 
applying for an open call to hopefully have a solo show at like a nonprofit small gallery. Um, yeah, so I'm really, I'm really interested in how male art is for everyone um, and it exists outside of that world mostly. Cool, thank you. Hila, did you have another question or was it your hand just still up? I didn't notice. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize my hand was still up. Oh, you don't have to apologize. I was just checking in. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry. thank you. No, no worries. Um, is, are there any other, so we have a, a few minutes left. I'm happy to go back to the list um, or we, I, folks are also welcome to ask their own questions. Okay, maybe we'll go. Maybe folks are just feeling a little bit shy, which is okay. Um, I had a, I have a question. Um, meets maybe that's not from the question list, but just my own um, kind of curiosity. Since this is a class, and a lot of us are um, students who are actually just like beginning our um, university and our kind of um, like journey right on on thinking about our own practice um and our artwork and what that will be in the world i wonder are there any you you gave us um some great citations um from um octavia butler in your talk um also from um carrion um and uh, dolores hayden different folks but were there any like texts or um films or things that you looked at um, early in your um, career, early in your studies that were enabling to you or that maybe you even still think about now as a maker? Yeah, um, there's this book by Louise Bourgeois. I think it's called Reconstruction of the Father, Destruction of the Father. And that book meant a lot to me. And, you know, a lot of Louise Bourgeois' work because it deals with the personal narrative, her personal narrative um, and her strange relationship with her father, her family members, her relationship to her body, sexuality, um, and just emotively expressing that. And yeah, that that book is very powerful and important to me because it includes a lot of family photographs. Um, yeah. Cool. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to look that up. And if, if, for some reason that is available like via JSTOR or whatever service through our library, I'll make sure to link that for students who may be um, interested. And otherwise I'll post a link to it. Um, thank you very much. And I want to, so I'm looking at our time and we have about four minutes left. Um, so I want to ask, I think I, because I provided sort of three overarching questions um, for all of our speakers. So it's like all of the speakers are looking at the kind of same set of questions. I think the big one um, that I am always curious about is the final one, which is just around like what takeaway. So I think if um, there's like one thing about your work and your way of making um, that you would like folks to remember that you think is important about your practice, um, or it could be like a couple, it, like there's, it's also not that strict. Um, what, what would that be? What do, you, what do you want us to walk away with as students in um, community today after listening to you share about your practice? Yeah. Um... I would say like, don't be scared or shy to address your own personal narrative. Um, and that it could be a release and that it could be like a voice that someone else could hear that could make them feel more validated or less alone. I think that is why I tell myself I do a lot of, when I do my more personal work that that's the reason um yeah don't be scared and if your work doesn't seem like it fits in with what you think is being celebrated at the moment 
like just keep making it um it has a place especially if you're like BIPOC or queer or something you know I feel like really give yourself a break the, the world isn't very set up for you to you know have it easy as easy as others so be gentle on yourself yeah Thank you, Mitsuko. I think, yeah, I think that's a great way to maybe um, conclude. I think a reminder to be gentle and to be kind to ourselves um, is always so important. I appreciate you so much for coming to speak to us this evening. Um, Mitsuko's in, in New York, everybody, so it's, it's sort of like late for her. And so thank you for staying up late for us um, and for, for doing this. Um, I wanna just uh, make a brief announcement that next week um, we will have Mello Brown, who is a graphic novelist um, and a screenwriter joining us. And so at 5.30 next week, you can um, log on and listen to that talk, um, which will be the second talk in the series. Mitsuko, thank you again so much and um, good night and good night to all of the folks in the class and all of the community members who joined us. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you, I'll see you all soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye everybody. Bye, good night.